Eumenes of Cardia, executed with reluctance in 316 BCE. Eumenes of Cardia was a Greek who served under Philip II and Alexander in mostly administrative roles. There is some disagreement about how he first entered into Macedonian service. The lost historian Durus says that Eumenes was the son of a poor wagon driver in the Thracian Chersonese. In this version of events, Eumenes and other young boys were wrestling, and Eumenes stood out as being skillful, which attracted the attention of Philip II, who happened to be there. Philip then took young Eumenes back to his court and had him thoroughly educated as both a scholar and a soldier. This story is highly improbable, even if it makes for a good story. The other sources that Plutarch had access to say that Eumenes' father had hosted Philip once, and the two of them had become friends, which then led to Eumenes entering into the service of the Macedonian king. This second story is far more plausible for a number of reasons. First, we know that Philip was willing to advance the sons of his Greek friends, as exemplified by the career of Aristotle, who was the son of Philip's court physician. Second, Philip's life was chaotic for several years between his teens and his accession to the throne, which means that there were plenty of opportunities for someone to give him shelter and earn his gratitude. The third reason for preferring the second story of Eumenes' origins is that it is most in line with the socioeconomic norms of the day for only elite Greeks to rise to prominence at foreign courts. Eumenes had what Plutarch describes as a hereditary political feud with the tyrant of his home city of Cardia, which increases the likelihood that his father's profession was something more lucrative than that of a wagon driver and that his family was one of the most prominent in the city. At any rate, Eumenes came of age and entered into Philip's service toward the end of Philip's reign. He was a few years older than Alexander, which means that he was very close in age to some of Alexander's chief lieutenants, such as Perdiccas, Leonidas, Ptolemy, and Hephaestion. Eumenes' friendship with Alexander seems to have predated Alexander's accession by many years, and he was at Alexander's side from the beginning of his reign, serving as Alexander's chief secretary. As the keeper of Alexander's papers and correspondence, Eumenes' secretary work, secretarial work almost certainly played a role in helping to preserve some of the information that later historians covering Alexander's campaigns were able to draw on. Like most of Alexander's key officials, Eumenes was able to amass considerable personal wealth during the campaign. During Alexander's campaign in India, he began to utilize Eumenes in an expanded role as a military commander, and Eumenes was entrusted with the command of independent units, something that Alexander did not give readily or to many men. When Hephaestion died in 324, Perdiccas advanced to replace him as Alexander's right-hand man, and Eumenes, despite his Greek origins, advanced to replace Perdiccas as one of Alexander's chief administrators and assistants. Arguably, Eumenes' advancement in both instances had to do with Alexander wanting to empower loyal men. However, after Alexander's death, Eumenes would show that he had real ability and that the king's faith in him had been well placed. Alexander held Eumenes in high enough esteem that he arranged for Eumenes to marry the sister of his mistress, thus making Eumenes a step-uncle to his illegitimate son, Heracles. Despite Eumenes' success under Alexander and their deep friendship, his service during those years was not always smooth or spotless. When Alexander was assembling a fleet for Nearchus, he asked all of his friends, including Eumenes, for a loan of 300 talents to cover the expenses. All of Alexander's other friends were able to send the requested cash. Eumenes, however, only sent 100 talents and wrote a letter saying that even that sum had been difficult for him to muster. Alexander suspected that Eumenes was holding out on him, so he sent someone to set fire to Eumenes' tent so that Eumenes would have to remove all of his silver and gold and reveal that he was holding out on his friend and benefactor. In the event, the fire spread too quickly for Eumenes' stash to be removed, and the fire also consumed the official documents that Eumenes had been keeping. It turned out that Eumenes had 1,000 talents in his tent, but these had been melted by the fire. Plutarch does not say whether or not Alexander remunerated Eumenes for his lost wealth, but he does tell us that Alexander ordered his officials to send Eumenes new copies of all the lost documents. The implication is that Alexander fully forgave Eumenes, which isn't surprising given how lenient Alexander was to Harpalus. As to the burning question of why Eumenes was holding out on Alexander in the first place, 
Plutarch provides no answer. The other thing that put a strain on Eumenes' friendship with Alexander was the mutual hostility that he shared with Alexander's best friend and chief deputy, Hephaestion. At one point, when Hephaestion was assigning quarters, he gave Eumenes' quarters to a flute player, presumably as an insult to Eumenes. When Eumenes went to Alexander to complain, Alexander chided Hephaestion for the slight, but then rebuked Eumenes for the disrespectful way that he had worded and presented his grievance. The animosity between the two men did not end there. In 324, Eumenes and Hephaestion got into a shouting match and exchanged abusive language over a gift. This would not have been a serious issue since it did not involve Alexander, except that Hephaestion happened to die shortly after this public feud. Alexander was deeply grief-stricken, and he accused anyone who had outstanding issues with Hephaestion of celebrating his death, an accusation that he seems to have addressed at Eumenes more than any of his other friends. To allay Alexander, Eumenes worked with him to glorify the memory of Hephaestion, coming up with plans to honor him and making generous financial contributions to the monuments that he proposed. Before we delve into Eumenes' activities after Alexander's death, it is worth briefly considering who his political allies were prior to Alexander's death. From later evidence, we know that he was on good terms with the Argeid House in general, and that he had been friends with Antigonus the One-Eyed when they had both attended court together. Since it is difficult to avoid interpreting Perdiccas's actions as anything but a concerted attempt to prevent any of his Macedonian rivals from establishing a firm power base, the implication would seem to be that Perdiccas preferred to employ Eumenes solely because he posed no real threat since he could not hope to acquire the Macedonian throne in his own name. However, it is likely that Perdiccas and Eumenes had a friendship and working relationship dating back to at least 326 or so. Perdiccas and Hephaestion were also on bad terms, and the two of them competed for influence with Alexander as they were the two top deputies during the later phases of the Asian campaign. The combination of having a mutual enemy in Hephaestion, and then working together when both men were promoted after Hephaestion's death, probably meant that Perdiccas had both bonded with Eumenes and come to regard him as a reliable follower. Certainly, Plutarch's notion that Eumenes sided with Perdiccas just to be close as possible to the royal family is a romantic fantasy from a biographer who tended to idealize Eumenes. Eumenes was at Babylon in the summer of 323 when Alexander passed away. Almost uniquely, and clearly due to his Greek heritage, Eumenes did not join in the debates about what should become of the empire. When Perdiccas and the chief officers of the empire left Babylon in the hands of Meliager and his mutinous infantry, Eumenes stayed behind, even though his sympathies were with the senior officers. In Babylon, Eumenes helped to calm down the angry veterans and helped to effect reconciliation between Perdiccas and Meliager. During the settlement at Babylon in 323, Eumenes was sent to govern Cappadocia and Paphlagonia with instructions to acquire the north coast all the way to the city of Trebizond. To conquer this land, which was in the hands of Ariathes I, who had been Persia's satrap of Cappadocia and then had declared his independence once Alexander had defeated the Achaemenids. To aid Eumenes, Perdiccas ordered Antigonus and Leonidas to bring large forces to bear on the region. Unfortunately for Eumenes, this arrangement broke down immediately. Antigonus chose to ignore Perdiccas' instructions and did not show up. Leonidas arrived on the scene to conquer Cappadocia, but Hecateus the tyrant of Cardia arrived and told Leonidas about Antipater's trouble in Thessaly, where he found himself besieged in the city of Lamia. Leonidas was eager to go to the rescue, and his eagerness was further enhanced by a marriage offer from Alexander's sister Cleopatra, who was in Macedon at the time. When Leonidas first approached him about going with him to Europe, Eumenes declined on the grounds that Antipater hated him, and the combination of his enemies Antipater and Hecateus might very well lead him to be murdered. Leonidas tried to assure Eumenes that he could reconcile him with the tyrant Hecateus, and Eumenes continued to act as if he were wavering, and could be persuaded if Leonidas could spell out his position and prove that it was strong. At this point, Eumenes was merely posturing in order to get more information out of Leonidas. Perhaps enchanted by his own prospects and wanting Eumenes to become his first follower, 
Leonidas divulged all of his plans to the Greek general, including the bit about his plan to marry Cleopatra. After meeting with Leonidas, Eumenes and his followers fled to Perdiccas and told him about Leonidas's plans. Eumenes rode at Perdiccas's side when he conquered Ariarthes and Cappadocia. Perdiccas appointed Eumenes to govern Cappadocia and gave him a free hand when it came to making appointments. Eumenes appointed his friends and other men he trusted to govern all of the key cities of Cappadocia. Around this time, the first war of the successors was on the verge of breaking out, and Perdiccas decided to entrust all of his operations in the north to Eumenes, who would serve as the commander-in-chief in the area while Perdiccas marched south to deal with Ptolemy. Eumenes' first task was to back up Neoptolemus in Armenia, where he was struggling. Neoptolemus was both arrogant and incompetent, yet Eumenes did his best to court his favor. It may have been at this time when Neoptolemus challenged Eumenes' authority over him by taunting him that while Eumenes had followed Alexander with a pen and paper, he had followed Alexander with a shield and spear. When Antipater and Craterus began to move on Asia Minor, Neoptolemus warned that no one would dare oppose them and that Craterus was so popular with the men that they would probably defect rather than fight. To combat this probability, Eumenes worked feverishly to hurriedly recruit and drill 6,300 cavalrymen from the region, an organizational triumph. Deeply offended at being forced to serve under a Greek secretary, Neoptolemus attempted treachery, but Eumenes detected his design. Neoptolemus got the phalanx to follow him and challenged Eumenes for command, but Eumenes' cavalry gave him mobility, and he was able to seize the infantry's baggage. In exchange for the return of their worldly possessions, the Macedonian phalanx agreed to swear an oath to serve Eumenes. At this time, perhaps not willing to overplay his hand with the clearly less than perfectly loyal Macedonian rank and file, Eumenes did not impede Neoptolemus' flight. Predictably, Neoptolemus fled to Antipater and Craterus to air his grievances and ask for aid. Despite a long-standing grievance of unknown origin between Antipater and Eumenes, the elderly regent recognized that Eumenes was an able man and that his defection would shatter the spine of Perdiccas's cause. Therefore, Antipater and Craterus asked Eumenes to join them and offered him a role in their new dispensation. Eumenes, whether because he was loyal to Perdiccas or whether, as Plutarch suggests, he was deeply distrustful of Antipater, declined this offer. Eumenes made a counteroffer to just Craterus that he would reconcile the popular commander with Perdiccas. Whether this attempt at reconciliation was half-hearted or truly designed to drive a wedge between Antipater, an old enemy, and Craterus, an old friend, is unclear. But it certainly didn't work. Once negotiations had broken down, Craterus set out with Neoptolemus as his chief lieutenant, seeking a confrontation with Eumenes. The hope of Craterus, which seems to have been stoked in part by his incompetent second-in-command, was that when the Macedonians under Eumenes saw the popular commander that they would immediately defect. This was the only reasonable supposition that Neoptolemus ever made, and Craterus wore his distinctive hat to increase the odds of pulling off such an easy victory. However, Eumenes was also wise to this risk. Craterus' strategy was to appear before Eumenes as quickly as possible and let word spread of his presence. To this end, Craterus embarked on a forced march to Eumenes' last known location. Eumenes was aware of the approach of this army, knew who was coming as the commander of this force, and had at least a few days to think about the problem. As was frequently the case when a successor struck upon a brilliant strategy, the idea came to him in a dream featuring Alexander the Great. In his dream, Eumenes saw two Alexanders lead opposing armies, one allied with the goddess Demeter and the other one following Athena. The army of Demeter won. When he awoke, Eumenes realized that the grain was beginning to grow, which meant that he, as the defender in the upcoming battle, could count on Demeter's support. As Craterus' army drew nearer, Eumenes received a report that their army's watchword was Alexander and Athena. To win the favor of the gods in the upcoming battle, Eumenes ordered his men to use the watchword Alexander and Demeter and to decorate their weapons and armor with budding crops. Only about ten days elapsed between the surrender of Neoptolemus' infantry to Eumenes and the arrival of Craterus' army. To combat the risk of another mass defection, 
Eumenes did not let any of his officers or men in on the secret that Craterus was present in the enemy ranks. How exactly Eumenes was able to collect scouting data through his chain of command without any of that information leaking to the many Macedonians in his camp is a mystery to me, and quite possibly a literary invention, but this is how the story goes. To further reduce the danger, Eumenes decided to march up his foreign cavalry force under Pharnabazdus and the Greek phoenix of Tenetus directly across from Craterus with orders to charge as soon as the enemy was within visual range. He deployed his Macedonians on sections of the line where they would not have a high chance of glimpsing Craterus. This most likely meant that Eumenes' deployment was unusual and featured cavalry in the center rather than on the wings. To create some useful chaos and disallow a display of some kind, Eumenes rushed his horsemen into the fray and initiated battle early. This was quite a surprise to everyone, including the experienced and talented Craterus, who had not anticipated this. Meanwhile, Eumenes himself squared off against his mortal enemy Neoptolemus, wishing to slay the insubordinate and insolent general with his own blade. In the center, where Craterus was engaged, the Macedonian war hero personally cut down several attackers until he was mortally wounded. One of Eumenes' Greek officers on that section of the front named Gorgias happened to recognize the bloodied and battered Craterus, so he shielded him from the melee lest he be dispatched while still helpless. Simultaneously, on what was probably Eumenes' right wing and Craterus' left, Eumenes led an attack against Neoptolemus. Both men had the same idea of finding and killing their bitter foe. As Plutarch paints the picture, both generals were driven by a mutual and implacable hatred of one another. After a couple of ineffective passes with lances, the two men drew swords and had it out from horseback. Getting into closer and closer quarters, they wrestled each other out of their respective saddles and onto the ground. Neoptolemus was the first to rise to his feet, and this might have proven to be a decisive advantage, except that the grounded Eumenes struck him in the heel, thus hobbling him for the rest of the duel. The two resumed their hand-to-hand -hand struggle, which probably resembled Pancratian, just with armor and swords, but without the olive oil. Finally, Eumenes created some separation and struck a fatal blow to Neoptolemus' neck. Thinking that the Macedonian was completely finished, Eumenes was blinded by hatred and began to strip the corpse immediately. However, Neoptolemus still had a little bit of strength in fight, and he used the last of it to strike Neoptolemus in the groin, to strike Eumenes in the groin, for a minor but no doubt painful and scary flesh wound. Eumenes finished stripping Neoptolemus' corpse and then remounted his horse, despite a number of minor wounds to his arms, legs, and groin. His wing of the army seems to have carried the enemy, and it had the advantage in the center, but Eumenes wanted to ride to the scene of the action to provide guidance. When he arrived, he was just in time to see Craterus before he breathed his last. Lamenting the fate of this great general, Eumenes wept for his fallen friend as he complained that he had been forced to choose between preserving his own life or killing a friend due to the machinations of Neoptolemus. Eumenes' troops finished the battle and routed the remainder of the enemy who had followed Craterus from Europe. While Eumenes had attracted some attention prior to this battle for his handling of Neoptolemus, and he had never been exactly obscure given his proximity to Alexander, it was the second victory over the great Craterus that really made Eumenes a household name. His non-Macedonian lineage combined with his high place in Perdiccas's government and his role in bringing about the demise of one of the greatest heroes of Alexander's campaigns attracted a great deal of jealousy and animosity from the other successors. The news of this victory would have greatly bolstered Perdiccas's prestige, However, the news of the battle did not reach Egypt until two days after Pithon and other disgruntled Perdican generals had mutinied and killed the regent. Instead of being hailed as a hero and champion of the Argead cause, the combined forces of Ptolemy and Perdiccas' betrayers assembled in Egypt to officially condemn Eumenes and all of the other famous followers of Perdiccas in the north. Eumenes next journeyed to Mount Ida, where there was a royal stable. Eumenes took a large number of horses to refresh his cavalry. The former secretary of Alexander took the time to file an account with the overseers there, despite his outlaw status. While Antipater laughed out loud when he heard Eumenes' fastidious behavior 
in this regard, it is clear that Jimenez's motive for doing this was to emphasize that he was acting legally and on behalf of the legitimate rulers of the empire, the Argead House. Knowing that Antipater or one of the armies from the south would soon arrive and challenge his position in Asia Minor, Eumenes began to try to figure out a plan for defeating a force that would be superior to his own in infantry. His plan was to fight near the city of Sardis in Lydia, since his primary edge was in cavalry. Perhaps fancifully, he thought that if he could get the official endorsement of Alexander's sister Cleopatra, then his troops would feel inspired to fight for the royal cause. When Eumenes met with his old friend Cleopatra, however, she was not willing to endorse a cause which did not look like a winning one. As we shall see in a future video, Cleopatra was in Sardis to find a Macedonian successor husband and make her own play for power, and Eumenes' cause was inconvenient to her objectives. Cleopatra begged Eumenes to leave the area so that she would not incur the wrath of Antipater, and Eumenes duly obliged her. Moving north in the Phrygia, Eumenes made his winter camp. Despite his pair of victories and clearly superior military skills when compared to his Macedonian subordinate officers, the boredom of winter camp allowed the generals Alcetas, Polemon, and Docimus to dream of winning great glory. When they approached Eumenes to ask him to step aside in favor of one of their number, Eumenes responded by pointing out that formalities and technicalities would not protect them from death and destruction. To further cement his reputation with the rank and file and to keep his officers content, Eumenes began to sell off all of the farms and fortresses in the local area to his officers and then used that money to make sure that the troops got paid. In exchange for their financial contributions, Eumenes offered military aid to the officers who bought property so that they could claim their new farms and forts. It seems likely that neither Eumenes personally nor the Macedonian state had any real claim to any of these properties and that the stratagem for retaining his men's loyalty came at the expense of the local Phrygian property classes. These events were approximately contemporary with the Great Conference at Triparadisus, where the assembled successors made Antipater the arbiter of affairs and appointed Antigonus the One-Eyed to be general of Asia and guardian of the joint kings. Antigonus's first task was to hunt down Eumenes and therefore wrap up all of the loose ends of the First War of the Successors. To that end, Antigonus or one of his generals put out a bounty on Eumenes' head of 100 talents. Given what we know of the volatility and greed of the Macedonian army during this period, this was not a bad strategy for getting rid of the pesky Greek general. However, since news of this bounty came immediately on the heels of Eumenes' financial rewards for his men and officers, the Macedonians in his camp were positively outraged by the bounty and swore to redouble their efforts to keep their generals safe. The Macedonians decided that 1,000 men would protect Eumenes at all times, and they also allowed, they voted to allow him the, the honor of wearing a purple hat and cloak, an honor which was normally only granted by a Macedonian king. In 320 BCE, Eumenes of Cardia squared off against Antigonus the One-Eyed, the newly appointed general of Asia. Although Antipater was present and nominally in command, his advanced age and failing health meant that Antigonus was the only real opponent that Eumenes faced. Although Eumenes had taken steps to ensure that his men's loyalty, there were still some discontent or opportunistic men in camp. At Orcinii in Cappadocia, the two armies clashed and Eumenes was defeated. We have no details of this campaign, but Plutarch informs us that the defeat occurred because one of Eumenes' men betrayed him. As soon as he halted the route and restored order, Eumenes immediately seized the traitor before he could get away and had him hanged. This action seems to have restored faith in Eumenes' ability and to have removed the stigma of defeat. Antigonus knew that his old friend was a capable general, so he apparently neglected to bury the enemy dead and instead started out in pursuit. Eumenes was determined to follow the rituals of war, so he set out in an unexpected direction to elude Antigonus and managed to regain the old battlefield, where he was able to construct a proper funeral pyre. Rather than being angered by Eumenes' boldness, Plutarch tells us that Antigonus was astonished at his courage and resolution. Later in the campaign of 320, it seems to have become a battle of maneuver with Eumenes trying to avoid a direct confrontation with the superior army of Antigonus. At one point, Eumenes discovered that he was in a position to strike at Antigonus' baggage train, 
which held many slaves and a great deal of wealth. While taking these prizes would enrich and delight his men, it would shackle him to a baggage train and lessen his army's mobility, thus making a pitched battle much more likely. Knowing that neither he nor even Alexander himself would be able to prevent his men from plundering a lightly defended camp if they were to become aware of it, Eumenes decided to make sure that his men didn't capture the baggage train. Sending a private message to the general Menander, Eumenes invoked their old friendship and advised him to move uphill where cavalry would not be able to overrun the baggage. Alarmed, Menander immediately complied and probably also sent off a panicked message to Antigonus. When Eumenes officially scouted the new position, he feigned regret that his army would not be able to claim this rich prize since an uphill assault would be too costly. Whereas Menander and most of the other officers in Antigonus's army were amazed at Eumenes' conduct and thought that he was a paragon of virtue, Antigonus realized that Eumenes had acted in this way in order to preserve his mobility. With winter on the way, Eumenes realized that his army was too small to fight and too large to hide or keep concentrated through the winter, so he disbanded most of his army and took a small force of 500 cavalry and 200 heavy infantry to a small but strongly fortified city called Nora. Cramped but well stocked, Nora was a stronghold that would not be easy to either starve out or assault. Eumenes planned to pass the winter of 320-319 from this small city. When he arrived at Nora, Antigonus saw that Eumenes had chosen his position wisely and knew that he would not be able to end the war without a lengthy siege. Both sides agreed to enter into negotiations, but immediately ran into issues. First, there was the issue of Macedonian supremacy. The one-eyed general liked Eumenes, but he knew that Macedonian officers and men would never agree to accept Greeks as their equals at the highest levels of the empire's government. Additionally, hoping to acquire the capable Eumenes as a subordinate for his own bid for power, Antigonus opened by asking Eumenes to address him as a superior officer. Gamely, Eumenes replied, while I am able to wield a sword, I shall thank no man greater than myself. To break the impasse, Antigonus dispatched his young nephew Polymaeus, another old friend of Eumenes. The two friends embraced and then got down to business. Eumenes asked simply to have his offices restored and never mentioned his own pardon or security, something that everyone present found surprising. As the talk was going on, many of the Macedonians in Antigonus's camp were hurrying forward to get a glimpse of Eumenes and hear him speak, since he was now the most talked about man in the entire empire. To prevent his men from becoming too enchanted, Antigonus himself entered into the safe zone, put his arm around Eumenes, and escorted him back to the walls of Nora. At this point, it would seem that Antigonus was not deterred by this early conference and was still hopeful that he could win over Eumenes. Eumenes, for his part, was willing to hold out longer to negotiate for a stronger position in the imperial hierarchy. Antigonus left with the bulk of his army, but left behind a sufficient force to blockade Nora. While Eumenes had stockpiled enough food and supplies to keep his force fed for a long time, Nora was a cramped space, and there was not enough space for either men or horses to exercise. To keep his men fit and ready to fight, Eumenes come, came up with novel solutions. For the men, Eumenes created exercise rooms where men could run around by clearing out all the other objects from those rooms and creating a rotation schedule so that all of his men would have a chance to attend on a regular basis. When it came to exercising his 500 horses, this was a problem which required considerable ingenuity. In another indoor space, Eumenes had a suspension device rigged up to allow horses to run on a kind of ancient treadmill so that they were able to work up a foam and would be able to ride and do battle if and when Eumenes needed to break out. When it came to keeping up morale, Eumenes used his considerable personal charm and would have men over for dinner several at a time, eventually hosting all 700 men in his garrison. In early 319, news arrived in Asia that Antipater was dead. With the grand old man of Macedon gone, Antigonus was now in a position to make a bid for power and there was no one around who could undermine his troops' loyalty with the power of their person. This made Antigonus that much more eager to make peace with Eumenes. To that end, Antigonus dispatched Hieronymus with a good offer for Eumenes if only he would take an oath to be loyal to Antigonus. 
It would seem that Hieronymus was either given plenipotentiary authority, or else he was instructed to prioritize peace above all else. When Hieronymus delivered Antigonus's terms, Eumenes said that he was interested in this offer, but he would like to amend the terms. Eumenes used his charm to convince Hieronymus to allow him to pledge his loyalty to Olympias and the two kings. This had the intended effect of leading to an end of the siege at Nora, and Eumenes returning the local Cappadocian hostages that he had taken prior to the beginning of the siege. Once again, as had been the case with the baggage train affair, Eumenes had pulled a sly one, and only Eumenes himself and his chief opponent, Antigonus the One-Eyed, were aware of what had happened. Eumenes, by changing the terms of the oath, had pulled off a diplomatic coup. By pledging his oath to Olympias, who currently held no power, and to the two kings, neither of whom was able to speak for himself, Eumenes had essentially taken an oath to act in whatever way he deemed best to advance the interest of the Argia dynasty. While Eumenes succeeded in convincing many of his contemporaries, and even the biographer Plutarch, that his intentions were pure and that he was a dedicated royalist, the truth is that he was just as ruthless and shifty as the other successors, but he was simply charming and clever enough to clothe his ambition as virtue. Had Eumenes accepted the oath, he would have probably had a major role in the Antigonid administration, but he would have probably been forced to serve more as an advisor than as a commander. This, at least, was how Antigonus employed their mutual friend Nearchus, a fellow Greek and Alexander veteran. Eumenes, however, had tasted power, and he liked it. It is not entirely clear to me what Eumenes was aiming for when all was said and done, but it could have been anything from a chunk of Alexander's empire to being the real power behind the throne. Whatever royalist sentiments he may have had in 323 BCE have been displaced by his personal ambitions by 319, 318, at least so far as I can tell. Knowing that Antigonus was more shrewd than his naive emissary, Eumenes moved swiftly to reacquire the troops that he had disbanded prior to Nora, and he began making preparations to seek safe haven away from Antigonus. Once he had gathered a thousand cavalry, he departed from Cappadocia. When Antigonus learned of the terms of the oath, he was furious at his emissary and sent orders to his men at Nora to renew the siege. Of course, by that time, Eumenes had long left the scene and was either still recruiting his men or on his merry way. Now that he was free and once again on the run from Antigonus, Eumenes received a message from Olympias. In Greece, Antipater's death had led to a civil war between Polyperchon and Cassander. Polyperchon had enlisted Olympias' aid while Philip III's wife Adia had cast in her lot with Cassander. To ensure the ultimate accession of her grandson Alexander IV, Olympias invited Eumenes to come to Macedon to protect the child king. A message also arrived from Polyperchon, the official general of Europe, who authorized Eumenes to make war against Antigonus in his capacity as a strategos of Cappadocia, and authorized him to take some 500 talents from the treasury at Kinda and to levy as many men as he needed to win the war. Polyperchon also sent similar letters to Antigenes and to Thomas, who agreed to support Eumenes, although they were jealous that Polyperchon had chosen Eumenes as the supreme commander. If Eumenes were to be the servant of the Argias that he claimed to be, he was now trapped in the horns of a dilemma. Siding with either faction, Macedon would pit him against a king who had been acclaimed by the army and who was a fully legitimate relative of Philip and Alexander. On the other hand, he had now antagonized Antigonus, and he needed all the help he could get to fight that conflict. Eumenes decided to take advantage of his new alliance with Antigenes and Thomas, the commanders of the Silver Shields, the best troops in the empire. However, he did not want to be bound to Polyperchon, so he refused to accept the offer of 500 talents. Likewise, he did not go to Europe to aid Olympias in her war against Cassander, despite the fact that Cassander was the son of his mortal enemy Antipater. To fully win over the two Macedonian generals, whom Plutarch accurately characterizes as neither able to govern nor willing to obey, Eumenes decided to take advantage of their second-rate intellects by refusing the money and employing superstition. Eumenes told Antigenes and Thomas that Alexander had visited him in a dream, shown him a regal pavilion, and told him that he, Alexander, would be present at every war council and bring victory to their cause. 
The combination of the credulity of Antigenes and Teutamus with Eumenes' charisma meant that Eumenes had effectively created a third loyalist cause pledged to the ghost of a dead conqueror rather than a cause dedicated to that conqueror's living relatives. To create a concrete focus for this vague cause, Eumenes set up a royal tent replete with an empty throne and perhaps even an old cloak that Alexander had once worn. Moving east, away from the joint kings that he was supposedly fighting for, Eumenes planned to align himself with either Seleucus and Babylon or the eastern satraps who had recently driven Pithon out of Media. After marching east and settling into winter camp, Eumenes tried to negotiate with Seleucus and Pithon, who were stationed in Babylon. It is unclear if Seleucus had any initial interest in Eumenes' offer, but ultimately he and Pithon concluded that Eumenes was an outlaw and enemy of the state. They seem to have tried to convince Antigenes and Teutamus to arrest Eumenes, but those two remained loyal. Most likely, the real reason why Seleucus rejected Eumenes' offer is that he did not want to be trapped in a pincer between the victorious forces of the eastern satraps and the huge army of Antigonus, who was the single most powerful successor at this time. The refusal of, the Sele of Seleucus forced Eumenes to side with the eastern satraps, fresh off their victory against Pithon, who had tried and failed to impose his rule over the east. The two most important eastern satraps who were now in league with Eumenes were Pusestus, the Persianized satrap of Persis, and Eudamus, who commanded a considerable number of Indian war elephants. Since most or all of these satraps from the east were Macedonians, all of them felt that they were more qualified than Eumenes to lead, and all of them resented his leadership due to his Greek heritage. Knowing that he would never be able to win their undying love and affection, Eumenes resorted to an appeal to their self-interest. Taking out heavy loans from the wealthy satraps of the East, Eumenes put himself deep into their debt. His rationale for doing this was to inspire a desire on their part to keep him alive so that he would eventually repay the loans. Despite this move, it does not appear that the Eastern satraps, all of whom probably identified as military geniuses, were yet sold on the idea of letting Eumenes take the supreme command. When Antigonus's massive force arrived, the Macedonian satraps quit posturing and turned to Eumenes for leadership, knowing that he was their best commander. When it comes to the eastern half of the Second War of the Successors, that is to say the conflict between Eumenes and Antigonus, there is a serious source issue. Plutarch's life of Eumenes has one account, featuring a few anecdotes and only two battles, whereas our other account is more coherent and features three battles. Since Plutarch is generally fuzzy when it comes to most things military, I will only use his account from this point forward for anecdotes and try to fit those stories into the narrative in a way which hopefully makes the most chronological sense. During July of 317, Antigonus was in pursuit of Eumenes, who had crossed the river Caprates. It appears that the river had a swift current and was difficult to cross under any circumstances. It is quite possible that Antigonus suffered considerable casualties trying to make an unopposed crossing. However, Plutarch records another river crossing, which might very well be the same event, even if he gives the river a different name. In Plutarch's account, the other generals did not dare to face Antigonus, even while he was vulnerable crossing a river, but Eumenes met his men on the bank and repulsed them, thus winning both accolades and envy from his fellow commanders. Whatever the exact details of this botched river crossing, it dealt enough damage to Antigonus's army that he retreated to Ecbatana and did not resume operations again until October. After the Caprates River victory, Pusestus showed off his wealth by feasting the entire Allied army at his own expense in Persis. This was most likely an attempt to show that he was worthy of the supreme command. Shortly after this feast, Eumenes contracted a serious illness at a time when Antigonus was not far away. Eumenes withdrew to the quiet rear of the army to recuperate, probably hoping that he would be recovered before the next battle. When Antigonus' army appeared a few days after the feast, the soldiers refused to follow the eastern satraps in the battle and demanded that Eumenes be present and in command before they would consent to fight. Eumenes rode around in a litter and restored the army's morale. Seeing the other army cheer up and gird itself for battle, Antigonus knew that 
rumors of Eumenes impending demise were exaggerated, so he backed off and both sides entered into winter quarters. In October 317 BCE, Eumenes and Antigonus squared off at Peridocene. Antigonus seems to have selected the site as he raced ahead with his cavalry to seize some key positions ahead of the fighting. Whatever his plan may have been is not clear, and it did not work. We're also not fully clued in to what Eumenes' plan was, but it did produce victory. When the two armies squared off against each other, Eumenes commanded on the right where he was opposed by Python, who led the weakest of the Antigonid contingents. Eumenes was victorious on his front and in the center, where Antigonus was facing off against the legendary silver shields. But young Demetrius, commanding for his father Antigonus on Eumenes' left flank, was successful. The victorious armies on both sides regrouped and prepared to renew the fight, but night was falling and both sides were exhausted. Although the battle seemed closely contested and did not result in one side claiming the field, Peridocene was a clear victory for Eumenes, who inflicted four times as many casualties as he suffered. Following his victory at Peridocene, Eumenes encamped in the foothills of the Zagros Mountains in a position across an arid plain from Antigonus's winter camp, which was in Media. It is probably at this time that the other episode that Plutarch records from this war occurred. A mood of complacency had fallen over Eumenes' camp, as their side looked like it was on the path to an eventual victory. Once again, only two men understood the implications of these assumptions, Eumenes and Antigonus. Antigonus decided to break up his winter camp early and try to catch Eumenes' force unprepared and divided. It was a bold strategy, as marching in the winter was dangerous and terrible for morale. Yet, it might very well have succeeded given slightly more favorable weather. Antigonus's march across or around the plain was delayed by inclement weather, and this allowed the locals to inform Eumenes and the other generals of Antigonus's approach. Pusestus heard of the approaching army, and he, fled, he flew into a panic. Eumenes knew that Antigonus was close, and that he would not be able to muster his army in time to fight the one-eyed general head-on. Knowing that, Eumenes first calmed Pusestus, and then led his men to a high point over the plain, where he set up a large number of campfires to make it look like the entire coalition army was ready and waiting for Antigonus. Antigonus was duly impressed by the strength and vigilance of Eumenes and withdrew, only discovering later that, once again, Eumenes had pulled off a ruse. Eumenes's string of victories from 318 to 316 had reduced Antigonus's army to the point that the two forces were now approximately equal in number. The eastern satraps had originally decided to follow Eumenes because of his military skill in the face of the threat presented by Antigonus. However, they were beginning to feel confident that they could finish the war without having to take orders from a Greek upstart. Antigenes, Teutomus, Pusestus, and some of the others all began to conspire against Eumenes, although their conspiracy did not quite get around to resolving upon a specific design. Perhaps they even decided to let Eumenes win one more battle against Antigonus before ridding themselves of the Greek general once and for all. Eudamus, one of the leading satraps, and Phidemus came to Eumenes and informed him of the plot. If Plutarch is right, then these two men were not driven by their affection for Eumenes, but rather by a desire to reclaim the loans that they had given him, with the appropriate interest, of course. Eumenes gathered his friends and trusted followers and discussed his options. One proposal was for Eumenes to take up his most trusted followers and break off from the coalition army and head straight for Cappadocia, where he had established local connections and where there were currently no other major successors. Knowing that he was popular among the men, including the cantankerous Silver Shields, Eumenes had enough confidence that he could fight Antigonus and then deal with the disloyal satraps afterwards. In the early spring of 316, the two armies met each other across an arid plain at the Battle of Gabien. This battle was a bit of a confusing mess due to the dust that got stirred up, and it demonstrated the importance of having competent subordinates with steady nerves. Antigenes mocked and demoralized Antigonus's phalanx, promising certain death at the hands of the Silver Shields, and so Eumenes' infantry carried the center. On the flanks, Antigonus held the edge in cavalry, so Pusestus was routed from the field and seems to have become confused once the dust got stirred up. 
Antigonus sent some of his cavalry around to Eumenes' camp while the battle was ongoing and seized the baggage. Eumenes fought valiantly, but he was not able to prevent the rout of his skirmishers and of his elephants. At the end of this confusing and dusty day, the fighting had been indecisive but had badly damaged the fighting capacity of both armies, crippling Eumenes' mobility while shattering Antigonus' infantry. When Teutamus approached Antigonus to arrange the return of the baggage, Antigonus said that he would only trade the baggage in exchange for Eumenes. The Silver Shields had sung the praises of Eumenes just before the Battle of Gabien had commenced, and they had been the best performers in all of his eastern battles. Yet, since their baggage included all of their worldly wealth, they decided that this was the correct course of action. Approaching Eumenes on the pretext of encouraging him to resume hostilities and win the field, the Silver Shields then tied and bound the Greek general and handed him over. When Eumenes was being carried into Antigonus' camp, he asked for and was granted permission to address the troops one last time. He delivered a stirring rebuke of the Silver Shields and others for their treachery and false friendship, which evoked tears from many of his listeners. For the grizzled veterans of the Silver Shields, however, this appeal fell on deaf ears. Plutarch may very well have been correct that these old soldiers saw this move as the best route to achieving the leisured retirement that they had been fighting for for the last four decades. When Eumenes entered his custody, Antigonus had him isolated and placed in heavy irons. After a little while, Antigonus realized that the heavy irons were unnecessary and cruel, so he had those restraints removed. Antigonus could not bear to face his old friend, knowing that he was probably going to have him put to death. Eumenes, for his part, was impatient for a decision, and constantly demanded an answer from his jailer. Eventually, his jailer advised him that he should bow down to Antigonus as a superior, and gladly accept his fate, whatever it might be. Eumenes had never had much luck escaping Macedonian chauvinism. Antigonus was still entertaining the idea of recruiting Eumenes to his cause, something that most of his officers were adamantly against. His son Demetrius and the Greek Nearchus were in favor of sparing Eumenes' life, but ultimately Antigonus decided that Eumenes was too dangerous and couldn't be trusted, so he had him executed. Unlike Antigenes, whom Antigonus hated passionately and had burned alive in a pit, Eumenes was executed in a humane fashion by the standards of the day and then respectfully burned and placed into an urn which was delivered to Eumenes' widow and children. Eumenes was probably about 44 years old at the time of his death, and if Plutarch's description is to be believed, then all of his years of hard campaigning never caught up with him physically, so he looked much younger and smoother than his contemporaries. It cannot really be said that any of the Macedonians responsible for Eumenes' death ever had much comeuppance for their actions that they wouldn't have received anyway due to their unchecked ambition. The only group of men who lived to rue a day when they turned on Eumenes were the Silver Shields. After suffering two routs at the hands of this unit and losing many Macedonian soldiers in the process, Antigonus had developed a visceral hatred for this elite unit. Combined with his experience at Triparadisus, where the Silver Shield mutiny had nearly killed him, Antigonus regarded them as wicked and inhuman villains. Accordingly, Antigonus broke up the unit and sent it off in small detachments to distant Aracosia, where they would be given hazardous duties. So much for the golden years of the 60-somethings who made up the Silver Shields. Plutarch's estimation of Eumenes is that he was a man of great virtue who was loyal to the Argia dynasty. He died fighting for the cause of Alexander IV against his old friend Antigonus, who was the most obvious threat to Argiad continuity. The only faults that Plutarch finds with Eumenes were that he was fond of war for its own sake, whereas a man of better virtue would only value war as a tool of last resort, and that he complained about having to wait for Antigonus to decide his fate for so long. This view, or an even more positive one, has been dominant in most modern treatments of Eumenes, and it could be said to be the standard view. In this video, I have suggested a somewhat darker interpretation of Eumenes' motives. Assuming that Eumenes was a pure-hearted royalist is at best naive and barely plausible based on even Plutarch's hagiography. Eumenes could be greedy and cunning as he showed by withholding funds from Alexander in India. While he was charming and far removed from being the most duplicitous of the successors, 
Eumenes still had a ruthless and exploitative streak. While some modern scholars write about Eumenes and the royalist cause as if it were an actual thing, the truth is that it was never anything more than a rhetorical device for winning over the Macedonian rank and file, who actually cared about such things. Aristocrats in both Greece and Macedon desired power above all else, and would quickly discard any nicety or tradition in a heartbeat if it enhanced their standing vis-a-vis -vis their peers. As a Greek trying to make it among Macedonians, he had to resort to brilliant ruses just to stay afloat. While I can't help but admire Eumenes' ingenuity and perseverance, I can't help but think that his ambitions were ultimately hopeless, baseless, and therefore stupid. By 323, Eumenes had lived among the Macedonians for the majority of his life. He had served loyally and well, yet there were many Macedonians who did not respect him and wanted to cut him out of the picture simply because his family did not hail from their homeland. Given that half or more of the officers and a large number of the common soldiers would never accept him, Eumenes was attempting to force himself on a world that did not want him. Unlike many of the successors who vastly overrated their abilities, Eumenes was at least as clever as he thought he was. However, he had no chance of ever convincing the Macedonians of his legitimacy, and he was intelligent enough to realize this and act accordingly. Whatever else he may have been, Eumenes of Cardia was not wise.